Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders across Canada. Throughout this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. In today's episode, we are honored to be chatting with County of Grand Prairie Councillor Karen Rosvold. But before we get into today's interview, I have a small request for those listening or even watching this episode. Our other show, The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work, is looking for the top municipal news stories from across Canada of 2023. We are looking for the biggest political moves, the biggest municipal shakeups, or the biggest municipal fumbles of 2023. Now, if you have a story in mind and you believe that was the biggest news story municipally across Canada, message us today. We want to see what you were watching this year. Either visit crossborderinterviews.ca and click on the Political Trenches tab or direct message us today and have your stories heard. Now, on to our interview. Karen, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with a simple question, but it's a simple question that has a lot of explanations to it when I ask it. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Karen? Well, thanks, Chris. that that's an important question because we get so many people that go into the politics for the wrong reason or go into municipal governments for the wrong reason. Um, years ago, I, I lost a family member to um, kind of a, a mess up at the hospital. And so I, I learned the importance of, of advocacy. And through that, I, I knew that advocacy could do a lot of work. Um, go ahead a few more years. That was about 15 years ago. Um, go ahead a few more years and I was working for a small charter school uh, called Valhalla Charter School up in in my county there and there again um, I I learned how important it was to be able to work with the provincial government and all levels of the bureaucrats to the deputy minister to the minister and how important that was and then and then with all that I um, I was a huge volunteer uh, I did so much volunteering in our community with the Egg Society or La Plaza Egg Society with Suicide Prevention for Res- Suicide Prevention Resource Center, um, so many different organizations that to me running for council was that next step. Um, it was important to have people there that uh, really care about their community and aren't a one issue person. Uh, because unfortunately we do get that a lot in municipal government, they get in with one issue and realize Oops, we can't actually do anything about that. You, you you don't say you don't say people are sometimes a one issue candidate there, Karen. Um, yeah, I, I want to sort of ask a very sensitive question right now, and I apologize Wait. if it comes out of left field. But you, you talk about how your duty came out of a tragedy, and yeah. um, um, I, I I I say this with the respect that it deserves, but. The tragedy comes from the healthcare system. Yeah. Provincial would have been the sort of no brainer for me to say, okay, I see a problem. I see a problem in the healthcare sector. I'm going to put my name for it provincially. But you decide to sort of look at the community aspect of that tragedy and the advocacy work that you did after it. What was it about the municipal, the local governance that you said, I could do provincial, but I think my voice is better served municipally. Well, I think that's where it combines with my my volunteer stuff, um, because I was advocating to help us get uh, a new rec facility in my community. I do a lot of this other advocacy for my community as well. And I think at the provincial level, you kind of get pigeonholed into certain topics. And at a municipal level, we can actually have a fulsome conversation about all sorts of different topics. So like I say, I was interested in healthcare, I was interested in education, I was in in community investment. And that's more, I think, a provincial or a a municipal level because that's where we're the closest to the people. Um, The provincial level, there's a lot of people that have no idea who who their provincial MLA is or their federal MP is. But they all know who we are because we're the ones that get yelled at. Um, well, so do they, but a little differently. 
Um, they don't you're, you're, you're at the grocery store, store the grocery right? Store. Because you, they they <laughs> meet you at the grocery store and that you even meet them at the post office and they know that you're them because sometimes yep. you make the decisions and they know about it the day after. Exactly. And if I don't talk to them out there, if I don't answer my phone, they're showing up at my house <laughs> to have that conversation <laughs> because they all know where I live because it's a rural community. So everybody knows where I live and, and um, that's okay as long as there's not the death threats and stuff like that that we get once in a while too. We'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but I want to talk sort of about your upbringing, if that's okay. okay. Were you politically sure. involved? Did your family Never. talk about politics at the dinner table or were in, nope. in 2016 when you run for your first election in a by-election nonetheless, was that yeah. the first time you had been sort of politically motivated or even politically involved? Well, I've always voted. Uh, I don't think there's ever been an election of any kind since I turned 18. And I'm not going to say how how long ago that was, because that's just not polite. Um, that's 10 years ago, right? Never, 29. Yeah, 29 is sure, what I'm always. Sure. That works. <laughs> um, there has never been an election I have not voted in. Um, and in back in 2013, I think it was, I was actually approached by um, my predecessor in my division. And we were approached and asked if uh, I'd be interested in running or my husband would be interested in running because we're very connected in our communities. And at that point, it just wasn't the right time. Um, I had, uh, my mom was dealing with cancer and there was some other stuff going on and I was too focused on making sure she was well. Um, but then come along 2016 and he resigned in February. And I'm like, now's the time. Now I can make it work. And my family, my kids were all grown. Um, I had a new four month old, two month old grandbaby. And, and I realized um, now is the time to make a difference and or to try and make a difference. And so I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people before that by-election and was successful. So. so I want to talk about the role of elections and sort of the engagement process of the elections, because I think there's a big apathy around municipal governance. And I and I mean that with the respect that I try to ask this question. In that 2016 election, you are challenged for uh, the nominee, for the position. 2017, you're claimed. And then 2021, right. you have someone run against you. Um, right. you. You volunteer, you know your community, people asked you to run, but um, when you go out and actually talk to people at the doorstep, go approach people in their at their house and ask them what their issues are, you can sometimes get a different sense than what you expect to hear. Because you have an idea of what the issues are. You have an idea of what's going on in the community. But when you talk to people, sometimes you learn things that you don't expect. When you were going out and talking to people in that by-election did you sort of have a wake up call saying, oh, I didn't think these were issues that were facing our community, but I'm glad people are talking about it and willing to talk about it to me. So that way, if I'm elected, I can help them sort of navigate the system and advocate for them at the council table. Right. I really didn't get a lot of that because I was very active in my community. I knew a lot of the big issues that were there. Um, I had already been on a lot of boards in the area, so I knew a lot of what was going on in our community. I was very in touch with what was happening. Um, I did get a lot of, well, why should we vote for you over the other person? Um, because we were both quite well known in our area. And so I'm like, well, ultimately, I can't tell you who to vote for. I'd rather you vote for me. But ultimately, you need to vote for whoever you think is the right person for that role. And that's how I campaigned um, both times. It's just like you need to need to vote for whoever um, you feel is right for the position. But I will say that first election, it was, I think, about a 40 percent turnout. So in 2016, it was a significant turnout where the last time in 2021, I think I only had like 20 percent turnout. Wow. So significantly less. What do you think that that chalks up to? And I and I'm I, I I find this conversation already fascinating because 
I, I'm trying to understand why there's an apathy when it comes to municipal politics. Is it just because people expect as long as their garbage is picked up, their roads are plowed during the snow months, they're okay with the way that the government's uh, uh, operating? Or is there an underlying issue that you see that people are just tuning out of the municipal realm and focusing more provincially and federally? Uh, I think part of it is just like we don't have the news outlets, at least in our in my community, we have one newspaper, we have a couple of radio stations in the city of Grand Prairie, but nothing yeah. out in the rural, and they just don't hear about it as much. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a big part of it is they know what's going on, but they get all their stuff off of social media, some of it's correct, some of it's not. Um, what what social much. media can be wrong karen what are you talking about here i know imagine that <laughs> um you've been in the position now for almost seven years elected in 2000 and uh, 2016 it is 2023 now um yeah what, what has been the biggest change for you municipally when you first started i can imagine the issues you're dealing with today are similar to what you were dealing with in 2016 but there's probably some changes that you've seen and you go oh this is not what i originally signed up for but here we are addressing these issues for you what are those issues and what are those sort of eye-opening experiences even seven years in that you're still sort of trying to wrap your head around about why municipalities are dealing with the issues that they are uh, the biggest shocker to me was the misinformation, and there I go again, social media, um, because like this spring, there was a big uproar around the province um, about some land use bylaw issues and some other things, and if people would just come and ask one of us, we could give them all the information, um, but they would rather go to their friend or to a Twitter feed or to um wherever and find their information and so a lot of it was misleading i'm not saying it's fully not correct or whatever because i haven't read the actual articles but i'm saying it's probably misleading and so we got a lot of engagement out of that where people coming to uh, the council chambers and actually wanting to be participate and and i got up and i said in council chambers that time i'm like good and are you going to be here for our open houses and are you going to be here when we actually do update our land use bylaw? That's when we need you here. Because don't forget, just because we got a little blip on the wheel right now, don't forget this is going forward. We, we encourage the engagement because that's what it's all about. We're there as servant leaders for our, for our uh, members, our residents. Do you see engagement in the county as a issue or are people willing to give you their opinions on the issues that are in front of council? If they talk to, if, if I talk to them directly, they're more than willing to give me their opinion. <laughs> but in all seriousness, though, <laughs> because your role as a council is to go out and get gauge, uh, uh, sort of yeah. where the count the community stands, your ward where they stand. Um, when you do that, are people willing to potentially give their opinion, or do you sort of have to pull oh, yes. out of and in your role? How do you ensure that you're not just hearing from your echo chamber, the people who agree with you? Because you, you have to listen to all sides of the story and people who disagree with the decisions you make or even people who agree with the decisions you make. And you have to come to the conclusion yourself. So how do you ensure that you're getting both sides or even some sides of the story? Because sometimes there are even four or five different sides to a right. uh, topic. How do you ensure that you're listening to everyone and not just the people who potentially have voted for you or those who agree with you? Well, I, I spend a ton of time down at the hockey arena. I spend a ton of time at like our local, any community event. If, if I'm home at all, I will be there. Um, and I think, I think people find me very approachable, um, which means I get a lot of the phone calls. I get a lot of emails. Um, I get a lot of text messages, Facebook Messenger. They find me, uh, which is perfectly fine. That's what I'm, that's what I'm here to do. Uh, so I don't think, I, I, I think they get to me what they want me to hear. Um, from all sides of the spectrum. I've got a few people that they will make sure I know there are councils screwed up every single time. And sometimes I believe them, sometimes I don't, depending on the issue. Uh, 
But, but I'm for those as... who, for those who you don't agree with, and I apologize to interrupt, yeah. but I think this is a fascinating no, question: is the people that you don't agree with who may voice their opinion, you have to respect them enough to give them your time mm -hmm. to let them vent and sort of listen to why they think you've done wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've only ever hung up on two people uh, when they've called me. Um, the one I love how honest you are, and we're only about fifteen minutes into this conversation. I love <laughs> it. I'm looking forward to the remainder half hour of this conversation. <laughs> The first one was just vagrant, like swearing and everything else. And I just said, when you can talk to me civilly, call me back later. Um, and then the next one was somebody that's informed me that I will be dead. Um, I'm on a list and I just hung up on him. Those are the only two people I've ever hung up on. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold, hold on a second. You got a death threat? Yep. So th that was a year or so ago. Um, so last spring, and actually this all kind of works into context, last spring when we had, like there were several around my, on my council that got them, um, when we had all that engagement and a lot of the um, like watchdog groups that were coming to our chambers and everything else. So we had a significant RCM pre present, uh, presence at our chambers for a few of our council meetings. And I, I was super excited. Like, believe me, I was super excited that people are actually coming and engaging. Like that, that actually is one of my highlights of everything. But then I got a couple of replies back. Well, we sure didn't feel welcome with all the RCMP there. And so I explained about the death threats and it was nothing to do with them. Like these are good people, but we don't know who else is in that crowd. And so we needed to make sure and our administration was very adamant that they made sure that we were safe. And so that's, and once I explained that to people, they were like, oh, you had death threats? And then they were on, then they're all good with it. Like then they completely got it. But it's just about, if you're concerned, ask me. I, I want to ask, uh, this is, this, this conversation is not going the way I expected it, but I'm enjoying it because <laughs> I, 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 love when, me. I, I love when counselors are, are candid. I've got to ask the question then, because when you get death threats, it changes the way you think about people and it changes the way that you interact with people because you're always on edge. For me, I've gotten a few death threats in my time in just even doing this show because I got accused of being a left wing nut, a right wing hack it. Like, it, like I can't win with everyone, but here I am trying to do my best. But when I go out and I interact with people, it really does bring up a sense that I have to watch what I say and watch what I, who I interact with. But as a municipal councillor, you have decisions you have to make. You have to vote on these. And if people are threatening you, how do you do your job effectively in a society where people are willing to, because local councillors are the closest to the people and they sort of are known to the people and they know where you live, feel safe in a community when you're making these decisions that are sometimes tough and sometimes could bring tax increases to people could potentially have them potentially not afford food for a week because they have to hand out a little bit more money for taxes or services. How do you do your job when you sort of have that sort of uh, aura around you where you don't know if someone's going to threaten you again? I don't worry too much about it. Um, really? ultimately, really, because ultimately, um, as long as I'm doing my job the way I should, then it was just one person. I, I honestly believe it, it was just but one, still, person. one person is still one more than enough. Like yeah. it should be zero people in my opinion. I get, but I, I didn't take, put a whole lot of emphasis on what was said and, and, and because he had mental health issues. Um, which means like the, the RCMP said that there's not a credible threat for that, but I'm like, well, technically if there's mental health issues, there is a credible threat, but I'm not going to stress about it too much. Um, but it's funny, one of my, um, mentors, basically he, um, he was a counselor many years ago in my community and he was my neighbor who was one of the ones that kept poking me to do this. Um, he says, if you are always making, if 100% of the people are happy with what you're doing, you're doing something wrong. Because not, there's always two sides to every argument. 
And if you're concerned about making everybody happy, you're in the wrong role. So don't even try. Just do what you feel is right. Do what you believe is right for your community. And I've got a kind of a mantra that I go by. I will never say anything or do anything that my grandkids and my mother cannot see or hear. Because if my grandkids can see it and my mother can see it or hear it, then I'm cool with what I'm saying. Um. You bring up a good point. You as a counselor have had to make some very tough decisions over the last few yep. years. Um, and you're right. You're not going to please 100% of the people, yep. but you have to make the decision that's best for the majority of people and in sense, yep. all of the county. But sometimes you are going to piss off some people. How do yep. you know you're making the right decision? What are the sort of baselines, the sort of the check marks that you have to go through your head to make sure that when you raise your hand in favor or against a motion or a budget, that you're doing it that is going to impact the most people in a positive way? Well, I have to look back at my background at that point. Like I'm, uh, I'm a farmer. I will always believe that agriculture is important. I'm, um, I was a small business owner. Uh, I'm a grandma. I've got all these things. And if I, I think it's just about listening to all the information and doing what you feel is best. And if you're second guessing it, you need to look at it again. But if you can go with a clear conscience and say, yes, I did the right decision. And these are my reasons why I voted that way. Then I don't have a problem. I want to turn to my theory. And I appreciate your theory and your honest and your candor. I want to turn to my second segment because I'm conscious of time and I want to sort of talk about the county as a whole. But before I do this, as I always say on the show, this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. She is one of, I think there's nine nine counselors Mm -hmm. around your table, uh, council colleagues around your table. So she is one vote of the nine. (laughs) So she can't make things happen on the dime, but here we are. So- and in this, in this circumstance, I am speaking on behalf of myself because I, I have let my council know I'm doing this interview, but I am not um, speaking on behalf of the county at all. Yeah. So it brings up the question that I've asked every single person, municipally, municipal councillor who's ever come on the show, and that is, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the county today? Um, part of it is lack of provincial funding in all departments. It's the downloading of different uh, um, things to the to the counties so that we have to deal with them instead of the province dealing with them. Uh, people not understanding that it's our, our rural communities need as much as our urban communities. Like we are hamlets and our small uh, acreage people, yeah, they're not going to get garbage pickup. They're not going to get paved roads. They're not going to get all this other stuff, but they do deserve uh, respect and uh, an equity, not equal, but there needs to be an equitable balance across the municipality. So, so it I begs the question, it. it begs the question then, how do you see your role in addressing this issue? Because I know, uh, and I, I don't want to talk uh, too much about it, because I know uh, Paul McLaughlin, the president, talks for RMA, but you are yep. uh, a member of RMA executive board. So I want to right. know, how do you he- how do you get rural issues more prominent on the sort of provincial stage? And when you talk about downloading, and we can't forget about this part as well, Federal downloads happen as well. We just saw the mm-hmm. RCMP back pay on a lot of municipalities. Yeah. May not affect all municipalities equally, but it does affect them as well. So how do you ensure that the county gets its fair share as a councillor, as a council as well? Well, um, we make sure that we get meetings with ministers. Um, I just spent the last two days at a Alberta School Boards Association conference on behalf of RMA. Um, but I still made sure I had my comments into a couple of the ministers that were there this morning at the MLA breakfast. Um, I, and it's just about conversation. Uh, as much as people say, um, 
maybe some of the entertainment at some of these conferences aren't necessarily a good thing. It's amazing how many conversations I can get going during a hospitality suite with a minister or with an MLA to have like one of our big priorities in our community is 40X. Um, because right now we have high loads, high heavy loads that are going from like coming from Edmonton, from Fort Saskatchewan, from all these places, and then going right through the middle of the city to try and get down into the Greenview area. That's not safe. And so every person you talk to, you're talking Highway 40, uh, you're talking Highway 40X, you're trying to make sure that our, our topics are out there. And the more they see us, um, the easier it is to have those conversations. If they, like today, most of the ones that I talk to, hey, Karen, how's it going? It's not Council Rosebold. It's not anything like that. It's, hey, Karen, how's it going? Because you build relationships and those relationships can take you a long ways in municipal government. Can I ask a political question right now? Maybe. Do you, do you get a sense that the province is coming to the table? Talking to people is great. Talking is the first step, and there's always the first step to any goal is that first step, and talking is the first step, but action is needed, and if the province says we will talk, but there's no action that revolves around that uh, talk, then the talk is pointless, so do you see yeah. the province coming to the table wanting to work with the county, wanting to work with rural communities to address some of these issues that you've talked about? I do for the most part, like I think there's always going to be challenges because unfortunately, um, like we're the North, <laughs> even if we're technically actually only central Alberta, um, but, and, it, and it's challenging. We don't have the population in the North that they do in the South, which means there's a lot of funds that are directed to the South, even if a lot of the resources like the GDP and all this other stuff are actually coming out of the North. And I'm talking the whole North, like Grand Prairie, Fort Mac, the whole North, but we're not getting the same kind of resources sent our way. Listening to uh, like Minister Dreshen at RMA con conference two weeks ago, he was talking about um, resource maps and trying to figure out where is the resources coming from so that we can actually start distributing some of the funds there to make it so that we can help those resources be developed and do what needs to be done to keep those areas growing and prosperous and healthy and safe. And so I do see them coming forward that way. Um, we do see a lot in the last two, three years, we do see a lot of um, summer tours where Every minister seems to be doing a tour around the province and actually getting out into those rural municipalities as well as our towns and villages and having conversations. It's sad sometimes we do get kind of blown over by the big cities a bit, but um, some of us have some pretty strong voices too. And I, can, I I have met a few of your colleagues at RMA. Yes, you guys do have very strong voices. Yes, we do. Um, you talk about a very macro issue, provincial, federal downloading of resources and funding. Yep. But if I go talk to the people of the county of Grand Prairie, yep. number one today, and I go ask 100 people in particular, just say Ward 8, which you represent, and I ask them yep. what their biggest issue is, they may say funding, yep. they may say downloading, but they're going to give me a lot of micro issues, a lot of local yep. issues that they see uh, that are issues for them. How do you prioritize the local issues with county issues? Because you are there to represent the county, you are there to represent Ward 8, but you also have to advocate for the growth of the community. But you can't forget yep. about the issues that are there right here and now. So how do you balance the needs of the county with the needs of the individual? Ultimately, and I say it for province-wide as well as community-wise, if one part of the community is healthy, the whole community is healthy. Because if uh, some of our more rural areas in our county, um, there's a lot of things that they need that they aren't necessarily getting. And there it's the same idea as province-wide. You've got, they're going where the population is. And, and we saw through COVID and all the restrictions that, that came there, how important it is for people to have that option to not be in a highly populated area. We saw the work from home. We saw all these other things coming out that 
if you give the people the opportunity, they don't want to be in the city. They want to have a garden. They want to have their bees. They want to have a few chickens to, so they have eggs or, or some poultry for chicken dinner. Um, they want to have that stuff. And I think it's important that we give them that opportunity to know what agricultural is about, because without the farmers and those people that understand that, you don't have much of a population feeding. You got no population. Do you see a lot more? Have, have you seen sort of an increase of uh, people wanting to move out to the county since COVID-19? When I speak to rural leaders across Alberta, there seems to be an influx of people looking for housing in sort of the rural settings right now. Are you seeing that in the county? We were seeing it more before the interest rates jumped um, <laughs> because general, generally the acreages and things like that in our communities are um, a little higher priced, which means it, it's a little bit more difficult. It's not a starter home, um, but we do get a lot of families coming home is what we say. They're, they're moving home from the cities. They're finding a building houses on their parents' property. They're doing things like that because they want to be closer to grandma and grandpa. They want to be closer to the small school they went to. They want to have um, a couple of cows so they have their own beef. Uh, and they have that opportunity out in the country where I don't see too many. I'm sitting looking out the window of my hotel here in Edmonton, and I don't see too many cows out there. <laughs> And if you did, I think there'd be a bigger t conversation we would need to have about why you're seeing cows in Edmonton. But exactly. I, I, I kind of need to switch up this line of questioning for a second, because okay. I recently had your colleague, uh, Cara Westerland, on the show, vice president of RMA. Right. And she kind of called me out for only asking about the negative things about communities and not talking about the positive things that communities do. There you go. So I've got to ask the flip question that I originally started with the segment, and that is, what does the county of Grand Prairie get right? What do you do that you look at other communities and say, you know what, you're doing it okay. The county's doing it better. What's that thing that you boast about with your fellow municipal leaders from across Canada or even across Alberta that you say the county has got it right and we're doing it great? We do a lot of things right. Well, what are they? What are those things that well, you do? You right? know, we, we do. We we are very fiscally responsible. We work really hard to keep any kind of tax increases as minimal as possible. Um, it's about finding like our, in our budget process, which we're coming into here in a couple of weeks. It's talking about um, is it a need? Is it a want? Is it maintaining services? Is it enhancing services? Is it something that's required? Uh, and then we have those conversations like we just finished a community satisfaction survey. So we got we've got that engagement. We have our open houses where we get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that come through those different open houses every year. Um, we work really hard to enable our nonprofits in our organization, in our community, too. Um, in the beginning of October, we hosted us along with the Volunteer Services Bureau and um, the province actually we hosted it was called a reconnect conference where we brought in nonprofit organizations from all over our county and some from the city as well came out to it and we told them how to deal with record keeping how to deal with book keep, the book financial statements how to find grants um, things like that we have a, a phenomenal uh, fcss department um, they do amazing things in our community and the county oversubscribes, like FCSS is an 80-20 split for the province is supposed to pay 80%, the municipality is supposed to pay 20%. We significantly over um, pay our share. Like we put way, way more than our 20% in because we see how important that is. And FCSS is a, a program that's cradle to grave. So we've got the play schoolers, we've got the babes, mums and tots. And then we go right up to the seniors with their, their home supports to help keep them in their communities. So that's one thing that is phenomenal in our community. Um, and like I say, we also do this engagement to keep our, our, not, our nonprofits viable. Um, so that's everything like egg societies, um, athletic societies, because most of the facilities in our, re in our county are actually run by nonprofit organizations, not the municipality. We fund 
we give them grants, but they are actually run by nonprofit or owned and run by nonprofit organizations. Um, okay. You talk about budget, you talk about needs and wants. Yep. I've got to ask the million, sort of million dollar question here, but there is an affordability crisis that is grappling this country right now. And I know we were talking about the good things, but I need to sort of ask this question as well. Needs and wants are great, but you, you, you know the reality that the needs and wants are going to potentially have to be paused right now. And it may be needs, wants, and maybe next year priorities. Yeah. How do you go into a budget cycle where you understand that you don't want to raise taxes as much as potentially you need to, to continue the service levels that you have and help these great programs like FCF, FCSS, like uh, these nonprofit organizations and do it in a way that's sustainable, but not do it on the backs of the people who are struggling right now, because you are the closest to the people. You are the ones who make the biggest impact because your services give them lifelines to get help to potentially get those uh the, the, like you said seniors uh, is a big thing for fcss and that helps yeah. a lot of seniors particularly in rural areas how do you see yourself and your role in ensuring that the f sustainability of these programs are there for 2024 but do it in a way that's not doing it on the backs of the people yeah, we're very fortunate, actually, up in the County Grand Prairie. We've got a, a really good economic development department, um, and we are still in an area that is very active. Like, we've still got a lot of energy ind industry going on. We've got a lot of forestry that happens in our area. We have a lot of agriculture. We've got a little bit of tourism, not as much as I'd like, but there's a bit. And we're going to so, talk about tourism in a few minutes yeah. here, so get ready to boast Fair about enough. it. <laughs> yeah. But, but those are still, so we're still have some growth. Like we are probably, I think I heard yesterday that we're one of the fastest growing communities in the country. I don't know if that's hundred percent true, but I do know that we've had some, um, some significant increases in the last census from the previous one. Like we had like an 11% increase in our population. That's, that's a lot. So we don't have to um, tax our residents uh, as much as we would have to if we didn't have that growth. So we're very fortunate that we have what we call natural growth, not um, uh, tax growth that way. So I think that's a big part of it is, is encouraging that. Look for those extra ways to do it. Apply for the grants. Make sure you're getting the grants that are available. Like we're constantly applying for federal grants, provincial grants, you name it. We're probably trying to get it to try and help with that as well as we partner with some of our industry, even like we got a couple of roads in the past that we've, uh, we've built. Um, and the part, the industry's actually partnered in with us to actually help us build those roads because they're important to them, they're important to us and they're important to our residents. And so the more we can partner with other organizations, the better we are. And so we constantly are looking at it um, when we're doing budget and, We've got a really good team. I, I'm going to say our, our administration team, they do a really good job of bringing us uh, a pretty um, smooth sailing kind of budget. Like we go, but our budget is a cycle that it's not just three days at the end of November, beginning of December. We start in July going through some of the stuff. Like we've got budget meetings in July. We got budget meetings in October. We got budget meetings in November. We got budget meetings in December where we're constantly working towards that next budget and figuring out where we were, how we did, and where are we going. So we're really well positioned that way. It, it seems, and I, I, I hate to use this word because I always feel embarrassed when I use it, but it seems like you've got a little oasis up there. It seems like you have we do. a place- We live in God's on... country. <laughs> you just gotta look to... at my backdrop there. Look at my backdrop. That's off Is my that... back deck. Oh, wow. Wow. That's all my deck. As someone who dr has driven through uh, the county numerous times on his way to uh, the city of Grand Prairie, while I, when I lived up in Foster, I can tell you it is one of the most serenic drives and just peaceful drives, particularly once you leave uh, uh, Valley View and you're just heading towards Grand Prairie. It is just peaceful, like there's no tomorrow, especially when you get through the valley, the Pat Valley. Huh? 
<laughs> so I want, I want to talk about the beauty a little bit. And I want to talk mm-hmm. about tourism. Because I think, like you just said, I think tourism is a major industry that a lot of municipalities don't capitalize on as much as they should. Because I think it's something that needs to be talked about, but you have other pressing issues that are going on. So tourism is usually something that falls to the wayside. So I want to bring it up. I want to talk about it because I like it. As someone who's promised to go come to the, your community if you come on my show, so get ready to see me in oh. 2024 in the county. Awesome. And hopefully we can go grab a coffee. What are some of the hidden gems? What are some of the tourist destinations that people should see while they're in the county of Grand Prairie, number one? Well, our primary, our big shining star is our Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum. And so it was built many years ago now. And in conjunction with the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum, in the summertime, they actually do, there's a dino dig, like there's the dig site that you can actually tour. Um, and they've even partnered and got some of the um, the the boats, the guy, the riverboat guys, to actually take you on a trip down the boat as part of this tour. So you can actually get in on the dino dig, tour this museum, get in on the dino dig, and get the tour of the river at the same time, all for one amazing little spot. Um, but we are a gateway to a lot of areas. Like we have in our region, we have. Um, Kappa Falls, Canusa Falls, uh, Red Willow Falls is within the county of Grand Prairie. It's a real hidden gem. Very few people know about it. Um, and it is one that we're actually looking at partnering with the government to try and get some access into it a little bit easier so that we're not impinging on some of the landowner rights in that area. Uh, we've got, um, we're just on the way to the Alaska Highway. So we've got that opportunity. We've got phenomenal um, cross-country ski trails. And we have from basically from north in Claremont, which is our one of our hamlets, just north of the city, all the way down through uh, that area, through the city of Grand Prairie, down south of Grand Prairie, into the MD of Greenview, down to uh, uh, O'Brien Park. We've got a trail system, so you can walk miles and miles or bike miles and miles and miles all the way down there. Uh, I know the city of Grand Prairie hosts, uh, does a lot of hosting of um, major uh, sports. So you've got the sports tourism. We've got an organization called um, uh, Sports Connection, and they do, they help out all these different things where they're trying to get different hockey tournaments. And we've got like a twin arena in Claremont, which we do tournaments out of. And uh, it's a lot of sports, but we get, I seem to get, I live on a lake. I have a lake behind my house. I get a lot of hunters that come to my place. Um, they come goose hunting and duck hunting. And we get a lot of uh, big game hunters up our way too. So from all over the world, they come. We've had them from Europe. We've had them from the States all over the place and coming to hunt here. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but the county doesn't go to the BC border, does it? It yes, stops. It does. it does, doesn't it? So you're, yeah. like you're from almost halfway between Grand Prairie and Valley View all the way to the BC border. What's the square That's kilometer? Do you, do you know how large the county is by any chance? It's, it's, it's quite 5, large. Yeah, it's 5,500 square kilometers. And I think we have just over 3,600 kilometers of road. Got about 25,000 people is our population. Um, so it we have is, a lot. It, it is an outdoors men's paradise, as I said, Absolutely. I've been through it numerous times. So it begs the question, while you've outlined some pretty significant tourism spots that I'm excited to see yeah. when I come up, where do you go in the county? Where do you go to let it all get away? Just decompress and just know that tomorrow you're going to have to do it all again. What's your spot in the county that you can go to and just let just reset yourself? To be honest, it's probably my backyard. <laughs> Don't worry. A lot of councillors and mayors have said that to me. <laughs> a lot of people's backyards and their houses. Yeah, well, the thing is, is um, if I want to truly relax and not have to deal with county business, um, because uh, unfortunately, a municipal councillor, you're 24-7. Like, you don't have days off. Um, I go to a funeral and people are asking me for 
stuff about the county. And at that point, it's like, no, 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 this is not the place for that. Call me tomorrow. Uh, where it's very rarely, I actually tell people to call me tomorrow. I like, I'll just deal with it right now. But is, is so that my hard? Backyard... Sorry, sorry. Is that hard? Because I can imagine there's days you just want to be Karen. You just want to relax and just be Karen. But sometimes, you know, the moment you leave your property, and in your yeah. case, some people actually come to your property and knock on your door. But yeah. sometimes when you leave your property, you just want to be Karen and not be counselor. Is it hard to do that in a small community like the county? Or not small um, community, I'm... but in, in a rural community like the county? Sometimes, I, like I'm very fortunate, like my little home community of La Glace, that's where I live. It's like, I still volunteer there. I'm, I'm local caretaker for the local cemetery and have been for 34 years. So um, my family, my husband and I have done that, like I say, for 34 years, my son is working on coming into the helping take care of that. Um, I still volunteer at a local little hall. Um, which is kind of where I go to for a lot of functions. That's my go-to place. Uh, but I spend a ton of time at the arenas. So uh, there's, there's most people in my home community, actually in all of this, like my division, they don't pester me too much. It's generally when I go outside my division that I get cornered about stuff. <laughs> um, I, I am gosh of time and we're at the 45 minute mark and I have to ask the million dollar question before I let you go. And okay. it's a question I think every municipal leader knows how to answer, but I'd like to get it on the record. So that way we can always look back on it 10, 15 years from now. But in your opinion, what makes the County of Grand Prairie such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Well, the County of Grand Prairie, number one, just number, saying that yeah, is sorry. our we are number one in a lot of things. Got to put that out there. Um, basically, it's the fact that we have a community where you can live, play, work, and just enjoy a good life. Because we've got the jobs. There's we've got the jobs. We've got the space, and we've got the people that care about their community. Is that easy enough? It certainly is. Karen, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Uh, it's always a pleasure to sit down and talk to municipal leaders like yourself who are so passionate and who are driven by the right reasons. And I say that respectfully for those who are not driven by the right reasons, but <laughs> it seems like, and we've only known each other for now, probably about two hours because we got to meet each other at the RMA convention. And here we are talking now that you have your community's best interest at heart and you have the community of the County in truly on your mind at all times. So thank you so much for doing that. And thank you so Can much. Can I just for being make one comment? It is kind of just a funny statement on that part of it. Yeah. I um, Just after I got elected, I was at a meeting and somebody said to me, and I got really passionate about something, like really vocal about something. And they're like, we thought you'd be a lot quieter. And I'm like, no, no. My residents voted me in to have a voice. And that's the voice I'm going to share with you. So, it, Is it fun being the person who has the voice? <laughs> it can be. <laughs> Because I'm not terribly good at keeping my mouth shut, unfortunately. <laughs> hey, if you kept your mouth shut during this interview, it wouldn't have been a good interview. And I appreciate your nope. candor, your honesty, and your passion for municipalities. Thank you so much, Counselor. And thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you, Chris, for allowing me to share my passion for my community. And it was, hey. it was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. 
Creating content that sheds light onto the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help continue us to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.